Well, welcome back. Uh, this is chapter two, part two uh, of General Chemistry 1410's lecture. Uh, we're going to continue on our lecture of chapter one. We're going to more specifically now deal with the units of measure, uh, as well as maybe a little bit of calculations, what's known as dimensional analysis uh, uh, of different things. And so one of the things that we're going to do is we're going to start off with units. And units are very important in uh, chemistry. And uh, units are very critical in everything that we do. And, and I'll show you an example on the board when we, when we transfer over to the board. But um, on an exam or in a lab, one of the number one ways students lose points is through uh, not putting units uh, on their numbers. And it will result in not all total points, right? We're not saying you'll miss everything if you forget a, a gram or a, or a meter, but you will lose some. Um, there are two common unit systems uh, in the world. There's the metric commonly used in Europe and Canada. Uh, and then there's the English, uh, which is used here in the US, as well as uh, about four other countries use ours. Uh, scientists use what's known as the International System of Units, the SI, uh, based on the metric system. Uh, we'll, we'll see the different units. Um, we have to be careful with units. Um, and, and I like to show this cartoon, if it'll pop up here. Uh, there it goes. I like to show this cartoon to kind of to illustrate that, right? You know, the guy says, oh, that's a pretty nice 37.9 liter hat you got there. Obviously talking about a gallon hat. Um, my brother, when he went into Canada, uh, he went to the University of Maine uh, for, for his undergrad uh, career. And he went up into to Canada to get some, uh, for a trip. And he was like, oh man, I need to get some gas. Whew, look at how cheap gas is up here. This is awesome. But he forgot that it was gas per liter or, gal or you know, per liter as opposed to per gallon. And so we need to be sure we use, uh, be, be sure the correct units, right? We're aware of the units, we're aware of the, the measurements. Um, we have to be sure we're, we're actually aware of the correct case, lower versus upper, uh, and even to a smaller extent, italis at being italicized. Um, the standard units used in chemistry, or, or as shown here, you, know, you have the length, is the meter, lowercase m. We'll, we'll talk about concentration, which is an uppercase M. So try to make your distinction as best as possible. Um, kilo, mass is a kilogram, not a gram, right? Here's where the SI units kind of get a little strange um, in that it's a kilogram, not a gram. So if we were to use the official SI units for a paperclip, it would be 0 0.001 gram or kilogram. Um, and so, so we're not going to worry about I'm just presenting these to you and then I'll explain to you maybe a little bit when we go to the board, the ones that we're going to commonly use in the class. Time is second, temperature is the Kelvin. Um, and, and we'll talk about Kelvin uh, in a minute. Uh, the amount of substance, uh, how much substance is in a, is, is in a matter or is in a, can, you know, is, is known as the mole. And we'll look at that uh, in chapter number two. And so, um, just a real quick, just an overview of these. We're going to go through these real quick. You will not need to know these for on your test. If you want to skip through this one minute section, go for it. Uh, one yard is 36 inches. One meter is 39.37 inches. You will get all these conversion numbers. When we talk about converting from one to another, you will get all these. Um, and, and just this is how we define the meter, the kilogram. This is how we define the kilogram. It's actually losing weight and it's been losing weight since, since 2007. Uh, the second is the measure of time, right? And this is how we define it. Um, and again, last but not least, the Kelvin. So we're going to kind of stop here uh, and look at the Kelvin. The Kelvin is the temperature, right? It's, it, we're looking at the kinetic movement. We're looking at how things move. Um, the Kelvin is an absolute scale, right? So when we talk about Kelvin, we're not going to talk about degrees Kelvin. We just talk about Kelvin. At zero Kelvin, everything stops that it is supposed to be where all molecular motion stops. It's known as absolute zero. We have approached that close to it, but we have not officially gotten there. Um, and and what, so what we do when we put a thermometer in like this into a, a water bath or, or into, you know, our mouths, we're, we're testing the, con, the transfer of thermal energy from something that's usually warm to something that's cold. And so if you ever have a friend who always has cold hands and they put their hand on your arm, you know, that it's the, the heat is going from your arm to their hand and then you start to feel cold. 
Uh, we talked about SI unit is Kelvin. We will need Kelvin in chapter five when we talk about gases. So we'll come back to Kelvin, but mostly and usually we'll use Celsius. Um, we, we usually stick with the, the Celsius scale. Um, and, and so that's the one we're going to be using. Um, we can convert between the different temperature scales. You'll see the equations up, up here. Um, we are going, if I were to give you guys a problem on an exam and says, hey, convert 32 degrees Celsius into Fahrenheit, you guys would have this equation at your, in, in hand so that you would be able to solve the problem. Um, I will give you guys all the equations that we cover. I will give you all the conversion factors that you might need. Um, because again, we can find those on Google. We can go to the internet and find what we need to find. So we can change, we can change prefixes, right? So we're talking about, let's take say length or let's say grams even. So gram, we have one gram, right? We have one gram. We can change how much is in that gram by putting a prefix in front of it. So we can have a kilogram right, which is the SI unit of, 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 met, of mass, uh, that is a thousand times more than just one gram, right? So you need a thousand grams to equal one kilogram. And so we need to be start to be familiar with these prefixes. It's going to take practice. A lot of this stuff is going to take practice. It's going to take work, which is why I give you guys homework, uh, which is why I'm giving you guys a few extra bonus problems, may, not just extra problems, excuse me, uh, to do maybe to, to help you guys out. Um, you guys can please come with me if you have any questions and, and we can set up a meeting. Uh, unfortunately, it'll have to be virtual, but we can set up a virtual meeting and we can go look over the math and we can do some of the math together. Um, you know, Senta. So, so the ones with the arrows on it, those are the ones that I would expect you guys to be most familiar with. Um, you know, Pico, Nano, Micro, Milla, Senta, and then Kilo. You know, Mega, maybe, Giga, right? Because we talk about gigawatts when we talk about energy. Um, so those might be femto if, if you were ever to do environmental chemistry work. Usually the contaminants that are into the environment are, are measured in the femto uh, grams or the femto molar region, which is really, really, really small. Um, usually we do not work in quantities that would warrant anything more than a kilo. So that's why we're going to stop at a kilo. Um, again, if you have any questions, we'll, we'll, I'll show you guys on the board how maybe we can work through one of these problems. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll do that. There's something special that we can do with units though. And this is really the big, the big key for this chapter. And, and what that is, is any derived units are a combination of other units, right? And so here we're looking at speed. Speed would be considered a derived unit. We're, we're familiar with speed right now and a derived unit in miles per hour. So we're taking a unit of length and a unit of time, putting them together. And now we have miles per hour, or in this case, meters per second to do it in the SI unit. If, you, if we went back to the SI units that were commonly used in science, there's one that's missing, and that's volume. We don't have a, an official SI unit for volume. Now, with that being said, we're going to use liters. We're going to commonly use liters. Um, but just so that you are prepared to see this, because you will see this, is we can take any unit of length, any unit of length, when it's cubed, is a volumetric measure, right? And so what we can have is, you know, centimeters cubed is, this, is very similar to a milliliter. A meters cubed is a very similar to a liter. Um, or, I mean, sorry, a millimeter cubed is a similar to a millimeter or a milliliter. Um, nope, centimeter cubed, says on the slide. Uh, getting ahead of myself. Measure of space, another unit of volume, right, that we're going to use is a liter and a milliliter. So we should just be familiar with that. Um, just so that, because we're going to use some density calculations, you're going to see one centimeter cubed or a centimeter cubed. A centimeter cubed is equivalent to one milliliter. In, in, the, in the case of our examples, we're going to look at that. Now, why do we care about this? We care about this is because we're going to look at density, right? Density is any measure of mass. So usually in grams divided by any unit of volume, usually milliliters, sometimes centimeters cubed, could be liters, right? So, so D is equal to mass divided by volume. And, and we need to understand this equation. Um, and, and we'll show you guys again at the end of this video, I'll transfer cameras. Uh, maybe we'll do it now. Um, and, and so, but, but mass or density is an, an intensive property. 
it is dependent on the type of substance, not the amount. So what do we mean by that? If, if we were to look at mass, right? And now we're to look at mass of maybe, let's say an aluminum can and a platinum ring, right? If I had three pet platinum rings and five aluminum cans, the mass of the aluminum and platinum that I have has now changed, right? That is an extensive property. It depends on the amount of the substance that I have. Now, if I had one platinum ring or three or one aluminum can or five aluminum cans, it doesn't matter how much I have, the density of aluminum and the density of platinum does not change, right? The aluminum is 2.7 and platinum is 21.4, right? And so those, are, those, those densities do not change. It doesn't matter how much I have. And so one of the things that we're going to do, and let's see if I can get this up, is we're going to go ahead and transfer. Oh, there we go. We're gonna go ahead and transfer video or, or, or cameras and let's look at, at, at a density calculation, okay? And so let's say we have, so we have a 1.75 liter sample and there's a nice, I don't know how we can, Oh, we'll just do that. There's a 1.75 liter sample, right? And, and it's a liquid. And the density of this liquid is equal to 0 0.921 grams per centimeter cubed. So it's a 1.75 liter sample, and the density is 0 0.921 grams per centimeter cubed. And so we want to know what is the mass, right? So we want to know what is the mass of this liquid sample. And so let's figure out how to solve this problem. And so first thing we need to know is we're looking at the density. Oh, that mark is not working. Right? And we know that density is equal to mass divided by volume, okay? And in this problem, we want to solve for mass. We want to find out the mass. So what we're going to do is we're just going to multiply both sides by the volume. So let's put a volume over there, volume over there. When we do that, what we get is the volume times the density is equal to the mass. Okay, so now we're ready, right? So now we're, we're, we're solving for what we want. We're wanting the mass. Great, we're ready, right? Let's, let's just plug in everything and start going. Well, we can't necessarily do that, and here's why. Because our units are different, right? So we now have 1.75 liter sample, and our density is 0 0.9 or 21 grams per centimeters cubed. So let's set up our equation. And, and I use, it's known, I call it the railroad method. You can use it, you can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter to me. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start off with the density. We're gonna start off with the density. So if we were to just break those things up, so 0 0.921 grams per one centimeter cubed, that is the density. We know that one centimeter cubed is equal to one milliliter. Right, because that's, that's what we just saw. Now, here's why I do it this way. I do it this way because it's easy to account for different units, right? So right now we have a one centimeter cubed on the top up here. We have a one centimeter cubed on the bottom down here. And so what I can do is just cancel those centimeter cubes out. So what we're left with is 0 0.921 grams per one mil. It's the same density calculation that we saw before. If you wanted to do this in your head, and so when you see centimeters cubed, you just automatically put in a mil, you 
go go ahead and do that. I'm just showing you guys this is an accounting thing. So, but the question is, we want to find out the mass. And so the mass has to be in grams. Make sure I'm not off the screen. Right, so we need to solve for grams. Well, we still have that mill, milliliter on the bottom. And so, and so what we need to do, and we know, so we, we saw this mill right here, and we still need to use this amount of sample that we have, right? Because we said the mass is going to change dependent on how much we have. So, can I just plug in right now as it stands, if I just put that 1.75 liters on top there, would that liters cancel out, cancel out with the milliliters? No, it wouldn't. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to convert the milliliters into a liter. So now we've canceled out the milliliters, but what we have done is now made a liter. Well, that's fine because we know we have 1.75 liters of the sample. And so when we cross off the liters, we are now left with what we're trying to solve for in grains. And so I'm gonna go ahead and write out the answer on top here. And if you, if you think, as I'm going through this, if you're thinking, man, Dr. Bishop, I, am, I don't know what you are doing. That is fine. Because um, at the front here, it's gonna be you know, just a lot of information. Um, please, again, ask me if you have any questions. I posted another video on YouTube that really delves into this math uh, in a slightly different way. Um, just go ahead and please watch that. If you're still confused, again, just ask me. And so what we can do is if you see numbers across the top, we multiply. If there's any number other than one on the bottom, then we divide by that number. In this case, there is no number other than one on the bottom. So we can just multiply it across the top. And the answer that we get is 1,611 grams. What we're going to see though, and what I want you guys to think about, is why that might not be the fully correct answer. And so, um, and here is the reason why significant digits, right? Significant digits are very important. So there's two ways students consistently lose uh, points on an exam or on a lab, and that's through one, no units, and two, significant digits, right? Significant, we have significant digits because it tells us what we can be sure of depending on the measuring device that we're using. So what are some rules for counting significant figures? Again, it's gonna take practice. There's some practice that's on your homework. Um, we'll, we'll look, we'll come back to that answer and, and maybe see what we could do better to make sure that we have the right number of significant digits. But here's rule number one, all non-zero digits are significant. So if you see a number other than zero, it is significant. So in, in the case of 28.3, there's three significant figures or three, I, I say digits, you can use the word figures, uh, it's fine. Interior zeros are always significant. So if you have 23.004, those zeros are significant because they're in between two non-zero numbers. Leading zeros, right? Leading zeros help us hold the decimal place. And again, there's that leading zero in front of the decimal, so it's 0, 0.0. You have to put that in. I will say it now. You have to put that in. If you just give me 0 0.05, you will get some off because you don't have that leading zero. Because again, the decimal point could just run away and we would never know. And so you have to have 0 0.00045 only has two. Because all those leading zeros, all they're doing is holding that decimal place. Trailing zeros, yeah, it's a little more confusing. Uh, trailing zeros after a decimal place are always significant. So if you have 3.400, uh, let me mute my phone here. If you have three point, if you have a three point four zero zero, 
then that is four significant figures. Because if you have zeros after the decimal point, you put them there for a reason. Uh, trailing zeros before a decimal point and after a non-zero number are always significant, right? So again, here in this case and in point number two here, uh, it's between two non-zero numbers. So zero is always significant. Trailing zeros before an implied decimal point. So if I were to just write 400 on an exam, I could either mean one, two, or three significant figures. Now, I am not going to be that hard on, on significant figures so that if you put 500 on an exam, I'm not gonna circle it and say, how many significant figures? Uh, odds are we, we know the answer to that. Now, how can we clear this up, right? Because there's a way we can write our numbers that'll make it easy for us to understand how many significant figures, and that is through uh, converting to scientific notation. Right, and so if let's say we have 1200, right? One, two, zero, zero. There could be one, two, three, or four, depending on how we wrote that number. If I put 1.2 times 10 to the third, there would be two num two significant digits. If I put 1.20 times 10 to the third, there'd be three, and, and 1.200 times 10 to the third, there's four. So let's go ahead and quickly, oh, let's do one more slide, right? So we can put it in scientific notation. Um, if you need help on how to do that, uh, again, just, just, just contact me. So here's the rules for how do we know. Here's the rules for how do we know uh, what, how many significant figures or significant digits that we need. And one is it, it needs to reflect the major rules that reflects the least precise measurement. Right? So if you are in multiplying or dividing, it's the number with the least amount of significant digits is the one that tells you how many your answer should have. In addition or subtraction, we don't do much of that. It, it just kind of goes with the decimal point. Um, when you're rounding, right? When you're rounding, it's, if it's five or above, you round up. If it's five or below, you round, or if it's below five, you round down. Just be consistent, right? Don't one answer, don't take a six and round it up to a seven. And then the next answer, you take a six and round it down to a five. Don't, don't do that. Just be consistent. Um, to avoid rounding errors, try to, as best you can, round at the very end. Now, I give a little bit of grace on an exam. If, so if the number is close, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you credit for it. If, if you know, because I understand calculators are different. Different calculators lead to different things, uh, different answers. And so with this being said, let's go back real quick because I'm running a little long in this video, but let's go back real quick to this number right here, this 1611 uh, grams. Let's remember our numbers at the beginning. We had 1.75 liters of a sample and a 0 0.921 grams per centimeters cubed of the density. How many significant digits are in those numbers? That is correct. The answer is three. How many significant digits does our answer have? That is correct. Four. So what we should technically do is we should technically convert our answer into scientific notation. So the correct answer to this problem was 1.61 times 10 to the third grams. Now, if on an exam, because that's all we—that's what we care about, right? If if on an exam you were to put 1611. Uh, you wouldn't, you would probably not lose any points. I, I usually do both. I usually do the non-scientific notation answer and, and also the scientific notation answer. So why do we care, right? And here's where it comes into play. Why do we care about scientific notation is because it tells us accuracy and precision, right? Accuracy is how close we are to the actual value of what we're looking at. Precision is how we are close to each other. And so what I want you to do, I'm not gonna do it for you, um, but what I want you guys to do is look at these bullseyes, A, B, C, and D. Then you can pause the video here to give you a little bit more time because I'm gonna go right on to the, the, the final thing I wanna talk to you guys about. Um, and so go ahead and, and just say which one is accurate and which one is precise. They can be neither, both of them can be wrong. Like you can be not accurate and not precise. You can be one or the other or you could be both. 
those are the those are the the four answers so go ahead and, and do that uh, so we're going to talk about uh, solving problems different strategies dimensional analysis converting from one measurement to another measurement and again doing my train I like the train track because it helps me kind of organize my thoughts and, and organize the math if you have any questions in doing these problems, please let me know. Here, I, I'm just showing you some conversion factors of different ways that we might have to convert from one thing to another thing. Um, again, I will give you all conversion factors. So the 2.54 centimeters in one inch, I will give you that. Uh, I will give you the liters to quarts. I will not give you the milliliters to the liters, right? That's one that we have to actually know um, so that we can easily do those conversions. Now. Here's, here's the strategy, right? Here's the thing. Here's the steps that I go through. Here's the steps that I'm going to start to talk to you guys through, uh, especially when we get into more of the deeper math uh, in chapter two, in chapter three, and especially in chapters four, five, and six, is one, we need to identify the starting point, right? We need to know where to start, what we're given from the problem. And then we need to know where we want to go, what we want to find, what we want to solve for. And then what we can do is we can put one at the beginning, one at the ending, and then figure out the best way to go from point A to point B. Now, this will take practice, and this is why I assign you guys problems. Um, this is why we're going to do some practice math together. Uh, and, and you'll get practice here in the lecture. You'll also get practice uh, in the lab. And so this finishes chapter one's lecture.